Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, an update on the latest news from Southern Arizona. And we'll take a video tour of a museum that teaches kids about heart health. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. It's time again for Southern Exposure, our monthly look at issues from the Tucson area and other points south. And joining us now is Tucson Weekly senior writer, Jim Ninsel. Jim, good to have you here as we, uh, we're kind of all just sitting around waiting for this, uh, this legislative session to end. Uh, as far as the session was concerned, this go around, let's start with this if we could, just, just, just a, qu a quick hit. Tucson in the crosshairs much? It, quite a few bills focusing on Tucson. I think one of the more recent ones was a, a gun bill. Tucson has a requirement that if you lease our convention center to have a gun show, you have to have background checks on the guns that you're selling. It's the whole background check loophole issue, and the legislature does not like that, and, and they were proposing legislation uh, that would allow uh, outside groups to come in and sue the city if they had any kind of gun regulations whatsoever. Uh, elected officials would be personally responsible, they could be fined uh, or removed from office and uh, I think the whole idea was to scare uh, local officials away from any kind of firearm regulation whatsoever. Did that work? Well, you know, we're in the closing days. It hadn't passed as of yeah. when I pulled into the parking lot. But so I mean, as far as as far as scaring local officials, uh, is, is there still enthusiasm for these kinds of things in Tucson? Well, we already have it on the books, and and there's another measure actually that allows the police to check your blood alcohol level if you accidentally discharge a firearm, uh, and and both of those were things the state legislature was not happy about. So uh, they are certainly trying to get Tucson to reverse itself on those. Last question on this: as as, as the legislature says goodbye for for now. Now, uh, the image of the state legislature in Tucson in general, I know it's a generalization, but, but what are the thoughts down there? Uh, I, I don't think they're very uh, excited about the state legislature. I know uh, a lot of people are unhappy with the cuts to education, the cuts to higher uh, education, the university and uh, the Pima College and, and Maricopa Community College cuts, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and just the cuts to social safety net have a lot of people concerned. You know, they, they shifted a lot of costs down to uh, Pima County, and Pima County is going to have to either raise their taxes or, uh, or cut their services. So it, it's not a lot of joy. You know, we send mostly Democrats up to the state legislature. We have one Republican in, in Southern Arizona in the House at this point, and so we, uh, we definitely find ourselves on the losing end of most votes. And yet the Speaker of the House from Southern Arizona. David Gowan from a little further down in Southern Arizona down there in Cochise County. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, speaking of uh, what gets people excited down there, I know U of A basketball is huge, and U of A basketball was supposed to be huge this year and was kind of huge didn't make the final four reaction down there in Tucson. It's a tragic, tragic, <laughs> another tragic year of, uh, of losing in the Elite Eight to Wisconsin, a repeat of last year, very, very troubling. It hurts even more than losing to ASU up here uh, earlier in the season. And, and I, I think uh, we, we were all very sad on, uh, on Saturday afternoon when that, that we, we lost it there in the first half the first part of the second half and we, we allowed ourselves to fall behind and weren't able to make up the difference. How big a deal is U of A basketball in Tucson? When it comes to sports, it's the biggest deal we have in Southern Arizona. The, 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 we, we've had a lot of other efforts to, to have spring training baseball for many years and, and minor league baseball and, and of course you guys took all our spring training teams away <laughs> and they're all up here in the valley now and uh, our, our, even our minor league teams have, have moved away to uh, Reno and El Paso and, and we haven't had much luck in, in retaining those in recent years. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's where sports, it's very scarce. Our, our sports opportunities down there, and, and so U of A basketball is where all the focus is. And I want to get back to the sports opportunities in a second, but as far as U, is a ba U of A basketball, Sean Miller, the head coach, uh, seemed a little testy with fans that were being a little questioning of him. Uh, is Tucson ready for when Sean Miller decides he may want to vamoose? Well, you know, we'd hate to see him go. I, I think his exact comment was, uh, go root for ASU. Well, that was like one of the season. comments, but I think, his, I think the concern was that he was tired of people getting mad at him for not taking U of A to the Final Four, U of A fans in particular. Yeah, well, they're, they're where we are a, a demanding bunch <laughs> down there in Tucson, and we, we certainly want to see it go further. But, you know, uh, we haven't gotten that much further uh, except for a few times. And, and the nice thing was, no riot this year. 
That's uh, true. Previous years, That's even true. in the Elite Eight, we had police shooting the rubber bullets and knocking over people and tear gas, and uh, it was a mess. So uh, we got out of it without that this year. One more sports question. You mentioned how many things had left. I mean, everything from the PGA to bowl games, the spring training, and, uh, and these sorts of things. There's talk of a bowl game coming back to Tucson. There is. Uh, we made an application uh, before the first of the uh, month, and uh, apparently we're, we're aiming. Apparently, 40 bowl games just aren't enough, and we need to have a 41st. <laughs> we got to get the top 84, 82, 84 teams out in, uh, in postseason play. And, and so Tucson's going for it. We had a bowl game once upon a time, Copper Bowl. Became Insight.com ball. I think Insight.com still yes. a thing. Uh, no, it's, I think it's something else, like Big Ticket or something like that. Yeah, Ticket but City. You maybe. guys took it away from us. It's up here in Phoenix now, <laughs> yeah. and uh, we're hoping that this one will come through. But we shall see. Are, are, is, is, does all this? Do all these events, these sporting events, are they leaving because lack of interest, lack of participation, bigger money elsewhere? I mean, Tucson's a big enough city. Tucson's got a sports history. What's going on? You know, it, I think it's a lack of fan support in many cases. Just not enough people going out to the game. In spring training, uh, you know, we, we really never recovered from uh, when the team moved from our midtown field at High Corbett all the way to uh, the kind of the yeah. edge of the freeway yeah. in our, our new uh, our new sports stadium, which is a beautiful stadium, but it, but people just didn't respond to going to these games at that new stadium, and it was very unfortunate. I used to love going to the minor league games. Uh, they were a whole lot of fun. It was real Bull Durham kind of stuff going on there, and, and so it's very disappointing to, to see them all go, but it is fan support. It's just it's just not there, and, and people are willing to pay a lot of money to get these teams in their communities. Yeah. All right, Mark Kelly's brother is off for a year in space. This is the not longest space flight ever for NASA? Yeah, a full year up in space. It's a really a, an experiment. He's on the International Space Station. He took off uh, last week. Uh, Mark saw him off he, from uh, from Russia. They, they uh, He went traveled there and said goodbye to him. And uh, there's a very interesting study going on where while Scott is up in space, uh, Mark, his twin brother, is here on Earth, and NASA is going to be studying both of them because you undergo these changes when you're up in zero gravity with your, your bone density changes, you get a little taller, yeah. uh, muscle mass decreases. There's a lot of different things. There's radiation up there that could affect your DNA. So mm -hmm. they've got a full test on both of them before uh, Scott left, and, and now they're, they're going ahead and running these tests on both of them uh, over the course of the next year. And I, you know, I can't, can you imagine a year in space? No, That's a long, no. long time. I can't imagine a year doing much of anything as the same. I mean, just over and over and over again. But I think that's interesting. He's in space. They're getting tests X, Y, and Z. Twin brothers on Earth getting tests X, Y, and Z. That's a fantastic opportunity. Yeah, it, it's a very rare thing. You rarely find twins in the space program. Yeah. So uh, Mark and Mark and Scott are really breaking some ground there. Big deal in Tucson. People watching this. Uh, yeah, yeah. People pay attention a lot to to Mark and Gabby. Whatever they're up to, they they like to find out what they're doing. What about Martha McSally? How are folks taken to her uh, first few months in office? Very early on, uh, you know, Martha is proving herself to be a fairly moderate lawmaker. You know, she voted against the Republican budget that came out of the uh, of, of that U.S. House of Representatives recently. Uh, she's been out and about during her trips back here uh, from Washington D.C. and she's got a new piece of legislation. Uh, involving uh, trying to create new penalties for these so-called spotters. This is a situation down on the border where the cartels are moving drugs across the border. Border patrols down there looking for them. The, the cartels actually hire spotters to sit up on the hills and watch where the border patrol is and they can say, get on the, the phone to the, the folks moving the yeah. drugs and say, hey, stop, don't go any further, wait for the border patrol to go by. And it's a, it's a problem for sure because it, it, the technology allows them to really outwit the border patrol in a lot of ways, and there's there's there are some conspiracy charges you can bring against guys up there on the mountain, but you really have to establish that they were helping the drug smugglers, and just having a, a gun and a telephone uh, isn't enough to establish that. So, uh, uh, Congresswoman McSally is trying to find a way to create new penalties so that prosecutions can be more successful. I, I don't know if this will work or not, but that's what she's trying to do. All right, very interesting. Lots of stuff happening down there. Of course, summertime's coming, so it may slow a little bit, but uh, we'll keep in touch. It's a beautiful time of the year. I'm always happy to come up here. All right, good to see you.
One in every eight kids in Maricopa County is obese. Poor diet and lack of exercise are just a few of the reasons. Now a museum devoted to heart health and kids is opening its door to the public. Producer Shauna Fisher and photographer Ed Twarick take us to the Holly Hart Children's Museum in Tempe. From the heartbeat of a giraffe to the scanner at its supermarket, the Holly Hart Children's Museum is serving up valuable lessons. The, uh, the museum has um, eight major exhibits. They're all uh, themed a little bit differently. The exhibits are all interactive, which Len Gutman with the American Heart Association says is key in getting a young audience's attention. And it's really a world-class facility in terms of uh, children's museums. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the interactivity part really gets the kids engaged. They're moving around a lot, uh, interacting with the exhibits, pushing buttons, uh, reading things off the walls, jumping up and down. So that makes a big difference. Rather than just tell kids about the dangers of smoking, the museum uses a game of mini golf. The golf ball represents a blood cell. The tunnel mimics the arteries of a non-smoker and a smoker. The kids learn smoking constricts arteries, so they understand it's easier hitting the ball through when the artery is wide open. For these kids, it's the first time they're learning about their hearts and how they work and how to keep them working. But for 15-year-old Emery Miller, being heart smart is a way of life. When I was little, I was faced with a lot of challenges with my heart. I was born with a hole in my heart and severe valve issues. I've had numerous surgeries. Emery visits the museum frequently and shares his story with the guests. When I'm able to come here and see all the kids having a great time and enjoying themselves, it's almost like I'm getting a card that says thank you for everything you've done. The museum was created in 2011 by a group of community leaders, including discount tire owners Diane and Bruce Hawley. Bruce's mother suffered from heart disease. Seeing how decisions can lead down the path to heart disease is best illustrated with a trip to the museum's supermarket. Here the kids are challenged to select heart-healthy foods to buy. The kids scan the items to learn about nutritional content. Gutman says it's eye-opening. I sort of preach uh, healthy eating uh, in and outside my job, frankly. Um, so for me, that's the fun part, watching the kids have those aha moments when they, when they scan you know, the, the fried taquitos and realize that that's their entire fat content for an entire day in one serving. Um, and that, that understanding makes a huge difference. I, we hear all the time about kids going home and, and making their, their parents throw things out of their fridges. If Gutman sounds passionate about his work here, he has a very good reason. Well, I'm really lucky because uh, three years ago I suffered a heart attack at, at 45 years old. Um, certainly never thought that was going to happen to me. Um, and it sort of inspired me to, to make a big difference in my life, not just in my own health, but in making a career change and coming to work for the American Heart Association. Um, and so I did that last year and it's been really rewarding for me. And it's rewarding for the kids as well, as these are lessons that will last a lifetime. For more information, check out the museum's website at hollyheartchildrensmuseum.org. Ghost Riders in the Sky, a cowboy legend, is an iconic American song made popular by a number of performers, including Vaughn Monroe, who had a big hit with the song in 1949. It's also a hit for Johnny Cash. An iconic song was written by Arizona native Stan Jones, who had quite a life in and out of show business. That life is chronicled in a new biography written by Tucson writer Michael Ward. I recently talked to Ward right here on Arizona Horizon. Good to have you here. Thank you so much, Ted. Appreciate it. Who was Stan Jones? 
Stan Jones uh, was born in Douglas in 1914, and he uh, grew up, his, his, his father, Stan was not a planned arrival, and his father had abandoned the family uh, when, before Stan was born. So his mom struggled to raise him in uh, what was a pretty shaky economy after the World War I was, was over and the copper boom kind of quit uh, in Douglas. But uh, Stan uh, grew up in Douglas for most of his adolescence, and uh, spent a lot of time on the cattle ranches east of Douglas. He and his buddies would round up burros, stray burros, oh that were there, and they would hop out there, and a good friend of his had a grandfather that owned a cattle ranch. So this is where Stan got much of the inspiration for the songs that he wrote later as an adult. And he was a, I, I moved to L.A. apparently, your book, rodeo writer, joined the Navy, a miner, a firefighter, and eventually a, 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 a park ranger. A National Park Service ranger. He wrote the song In Death Valley when he was a park ranger. He, he had a wonderful old uh, stone ranger station that was built by the Civilian Conservation Corps, immigrant ranger station. And uh, his widow, Olive, bless her heart, who just turned 96 and is still with us. Oh, my goodness. Told me that he wrote it on 10 minutes on a Sunday morning. So I, I was going to ask it, was he, was he just staring at the sky? Was it a beautiful day, a cloudy day? At Death Valley, it's got to be a hot day. Uh, we don't know exactly what day it was. And, and, of course, the story is that the clouds were there. And yeah, yeah. Him. But he just had that image branded into his imagination from when he was about 10 years old. There was an old cowboy named Cap Watts that befriended Stan when he was spending his time out on the ranches east of Douglas. And Cap Watts was born during the Civil War, and he was a real McCoy. He had cowboyed across the West and had carried this legend with him. There's a couple stories about where the where that legend actually came from, but he imprinted that into Stan's imagination, supposedly when there was a really violent thunderstorm and they were working on a windmill together. And, yeah. and Cap told Stan that there were, there were riders, cowboys up there that were going to round up the clouds and, and uh, staunch the rain. But, but that, that stayed with him. So he, he took that. And, and the, the genius of this song is that it's very biographical because when Stan was sitting on that ranger station for the first time in his life, he was probably as settled and as happy as he had ever been. He was kind of a rake and rambling boy during the Depression. As you mentioned, he, he, he went from job to job. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of failed marriages, kids. So he, he really struggled throughout his adolescence. And yet he wrote songs all the while. It wasn't like he just sat out there and all of a sudden decided to write a song. He, he was... It's really hard to pin down. I, I was amazed I found anything from that Depression yeah. period because yeah. there's many members of his family that had no idea where, where Stan was uh, during, during those years. But uh, he, he met uh, Olive in Bend, Oregon, and they were married in 1944, and, and she remained his partner for the rest of her life. So when he wrote that song, he made it a, a tale of redemption, essentially, almost like a biblical kind of parallel, sure. uh, uh, parable. Uh, Cowboy, change your ways today. And so that's exactly what Stan had experienced. And so he took that ghostwriter's image, he took that life lesson, combined them, and made, uh, created and composed a very, very powerful song. And a powerful song, how quickly was this song? I mean, it, it, obviously it changed his life. How quickly did it change his life? Well, it, it's interesting because when, it, when Bob Monroe version first came out, Burl Ives recorded it first, but he recorded it just on 12-string guitar, and, and it was popular, but, but nothing like the Bob Monroe version that came out in April of 1949. Uh, Stan's uh, communications weren't instantaneous between Death Valley and, and Hollywood. Sure. Uh, but Stan got noticed that there was a royalty check waiting for him in L.A. In 1949, his first check was $100,000. Oh, my goodness. So, of course, what's a red-blooded American Arizona boy do? He, he bought a brand-new Oldsmobile, <laughs> <laughs> drove back to Death Valley. But he was still a park ranger and wanted to remain a park ranger. He loved his job as a ranger. So he was settled to the point, when you said he was settled, he was settled enough to know that the $100,000, maybe some more is going to come, but he was still happy in his life. Yes, he, there was no guarantees that the Ghost Riders uh, was going to carry him forward. And here he was for the first time in his life. He had a working for the government, working outdoors, had a job he loved. He had all the attendant government benefits. And he didn't want to just throw all that to the wind because he, he couldn't see down the road. But it became clear. He asked for a, le a year's leave of absence. But he and the superintendent didn't get along because he wanted to stand to shoot burrows. And Stan wouldn't do that ah. because he loved burrows from his Sh youth. Yeah, yeah. And so the superintendent was just, we just wanted to get rid of Stan because people were starting to, 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 to flock into Death Valley. And they wanted to meet the singing ranger. And they wanted to meet Stan Jones. And, and, 
and it just it just came to a head, and Stan finally had to retire. And eventually, it was very clear that they were going to um, you know coast for quite a while just on the on the royalties alone. From, but he from the song. but he did wind up going to Hollywood, worked on some John Ford films, and yes. was wound up being an actor. Yes, and to, uh, Stan himself was his best uh, objective critic. He goes, "I'm no actor, and I have the film to prove it." <laughs> <laughs> he, the, the problem was. He was, he, he was a happy little guy. Johnny Western, his friend, um, really, really excellent friend, said that Stan always had that little kid gleam in his eye. Mm -hmm. And he always had that whenever he was on screen. If he find anything that he did, he was on the Spin and Marty show, he was on um, Sheriff of Cochise, which was a, 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 a serial Western. He, he always had, he looked like he was always smiling inside. Yeah, yeah. And as an actor, you know, you want to you look sad or cry every now and again. Stan just couldn't do it. And, and he wound up dying young at the age of 49. What happened there? He had cancer issues. Oh, my goodness. Oh, was he a heavy smoker? I he was a heavy smoker, um, but he had some melanoma issues also back then. From there, being outdoors all the time. From being outdoors all the time. Um, and and it, was, it was interesting because he, his good friend Doby Carey told me that, that Stan had a premonition that he wasn't going to be around much beyond the, the age of 50. And he had told them that you know, many years before, and it, it proved to be true. Isn't that interesting? Why did you write this book? What about, has anyone written about Stan Jones? Well, that's, that surprised me because this started as I lived in Death Valley for about 15 years before I moved to Tucson. And um, I wanted to write a piece for a Death Valley History Conference on Stan Jones and his life as a ranger in Death Valley. And I started doing a little research, and, and there was essentially nothing written about him. It, it really surprised me. Yeah. There was nothing known. And I found out that his, uh, his widow, Olive, bless her heart, was alive and agreed to, to sit with me and tell me about their years uh, in Death Valley together, which, was a, which led to, to many many little avenues about what Stan was up to because there was nothing. People in his family didn't know what he was up to. I, I really don't know. The, the first I, eyewitness account of him actually playing and singing guitar is from uh, a fellow who knew him in Mount Rainier where his first Park Service Ranger job, and that was 1945. Wow. So I don't know when he learned to play the guitar or, or how long he'd been playing the guitar. And there's that guitar too, huh? And what's really interesting, this is a four-string tenor guitar. Oh. I don't think too many people know that one of the great songs of the 20th century was written on what is essentially an oversized ukulele. Yeah. Um, it was designed um, on, uh, from a tenor banjo in the 1920s. And the strings, you could either tune it like a tenor banjo or you could tune it the first four strings guitar of a, of a guitar, standard guitar, which is what Stan did. And that was his uh, uh, guitar of choice and that was a gift from Olive. And so I, I'm guessing that once Olive gave him this gift, because she knew he was trying to write cowboy stories, he yeah, was writing yeah. songs, and this was a gift from her saying, you know, I really support you, Stan. I really want you to carry this through. Have you had much reaction to the book? What, what are you hearing from folks? I'm, I'm getting some really, really wonderful responses from, from, from people. Um, it's, it's such an interesting, it's, it's a classic American rags to riches story. Yeah. Um, he was, it was so interesting. You know, he's kind of saddled with the ghost riders in the sky. Uh, thing. I mean, like that's it's his stairway to heaven. I mean, it's 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 yeah. like that's the one. That, but he wrote. He was a prolific, creative writer all the way through to the to the end of his life. He wrote songs for for the Walt Disney Company for for films. You know, especially John Ford. He wrote the uh, the theme song for the Searchers, which My is goodness, widely yes. known as, as John Ford's greatest western. Yes. And he wrote the theme song for the Spin and Marty Show, which was the number <laughs> one children's song in 1957. Uh, he wrote a great cowboy gospel song called Saddle Up. Um, he, he was just, he kept writing good songs and, and uh, he, he, was, he was a very, very interesting guy. And I, I'm really, it, it's, it's odd. I, I think it was the Death Valley connection for me, the fact I lived there so long. When I was there, I used to, I wrote, yeah. I started writing songs when I was in Death Valley. I, and I went to work for the National Park Service, Stan works for the National Park Service. And then I moved to Tucson and Stan was from Southern Arizona. So there's just all these different currents where yeah. we just kind of seem to intersect. And uh, here, here's the book. Well, congratulations on the book. Uh, good job and a good read. Thanks for joining us. We Thank you so it. much, Ted. I appreciate it. We want to hear from you. Submit your questions, comments, and concerns via email at ArizonaHorizon at ASU.edu. And Friday on Arizona Horizon, it's the Journalists' Roundtable. We'll have the latest on the waning days of the legislative session, including a look at bills signed by the governor and those that failed to survive the veto pen. Those stories and more Friday on the Journalists' Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening.
Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.